G'day and welcome to this week's episode of The Factory. This week we're interviewing Peter, who's been working on an RFID reader. How you going, Peter? I'm doing great. Awesome. Yeah. Let's get stuck into it. So yeah, we're talking about RFID. Firstly, Peter, what is RFID? I know some people might have heard of RFID in the context of, you know, maybe they know their cat has RFID in it. What sort of problem is this solving? Well, this solves the problem of uh, not having to put wires into your cat. <laughs> yes, so that, that's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> so you can read um, tags that you can embed in your cat or, um, or any device that you might have, tags like this. An RFID allows you to read these tags, get the data off them without actually touching them and that can be really useful if you've got um, some sort of something in the way between the two devices or you want to keep something waterproof um wherever you can't have an electrical physical electrical connection yeah, yeah. that's right Electri electrical connections can be tricky in the first place so yeah. um this solves that problem so that's really cool we've got some applications for rfid how does this work how do we get communication without a physical wire? Well, it all starts with the RFID chip and it generates a high frequency signal, which goes into a coil, which is embedded in the printed circuit board of this board. That coil radiates a magnetic field yeah. <laughs> that um, can be picked up um, by a reading card, picks up the, um, the signal and energy harvests that signal. So there's enough power in that signal to start the chip to, and for the chip to read whatever information is coming from the RFID reader and then uh, respond accordingly and send data back to the RFID reader. So that's really cool. We've got this working board. How did we get there? There's lots of prototypes on the board. What were the design goals? What were the challenges? What was the process for getting there? All right. So the challenge here is to get as much power as possible from our uh, driver chip and into our tag that we're reading yeah. Um, so, uh, and bridging that air gap, getting that power through enough to actually start the chip and, and allow it to. Well, this thing actually has to turn on, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah. It's got to be able to actually run digital logic. So the, the driver IC chip, uh, is, uh, outputs its power via like an, an inbuilt, uh, H bridge. And that's a very digital type of circuit. It's going to be lots of harmonics coming out of that. That's yeah. right. So it's yeah, it's rough. It's just on or off and it's just pushing and pulling at this at this coil that we've got here. And the first thing that we need to do to in order to suppress the uh, electromagnetic interference is to put a low pass filter in to stop stray components above that sort of 13.56 megahertz that we're actually interested in. Yeah, cool. So we have to design an, a, a low pass filter. After we've done our low pass filter, then we need to do impedance matching from the the low impedance uh, driver IC to the high impedance or reasonably high impedance. Relatively in high impedance, yeah. <laughs> um, impedance of that antenna. And so we have to build a matching circuit using passive capacitors and inductors. And also make sure we don't burn out the chip. And that's right. Yeah, yes, we don't, 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 don't want to make smoke. It's not yeah. a smoke generator. So we want to get as much power <laughs> transfer as we can. But we don't want to just burn the whole thing up. Yeah, cool. So Peter, what's the design process? How do we get this low pass filter there? How do we work out the matching circuit? Okay, so the design process is fun. What we have to do <laughs> is uh, the first fun. thing that we need to do is to have a look at our at our requirements for PicoDev. The PicoDev has a very specific um, dimensions. So the first thing to do is just design a coil that matches. So we're not that. even designing a matching circuit first. You're choosing your coil. No, yeah. <laughs> you start with the yeah, the coil. And so you design a coil that you go, this coil looks like it might just work. You can't, not with any confidence, but it might just work. So design so the coil. So could you say it was an educated guess? We have the yeah. more dimensions, we guessed. What what went into that educated guess? What made us what made what made us choose a particular dimensions for our coil? Or a particular number of turns? Well, okay, so, so more turns means that you get um Potentially, um, well, bigger inductance can allow you to to get better coupling to, to the device. So you're thinking like stronger bigger magnetic distance. field with more turns, yeah. More turns <laughs> equals more more of an inductor. <laughs> <laughs> more is better, right? Yeah. <laughs> we just throw everything at this and see if it works. So so we started off with um with this one here. Uh, this one has three turns on the top and three turns on the bottom, so six turns total, and. Great, that's a great starting point. Do you remember the the trace thickness on that one? Or? About 0.2 millimeters, 0 .2, roughly. Yeah, pretty thin traces, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> then we started doing our measurements and found that the 
inductance was fine. The resistance was just too high. Yes, well, basically, we made a smashing circuit for it and the bandwidth was massive. Yeah. (laughs) You know, we had this thing operating at 13.56 megahertz and the bandwidth on our matching circuit was like five megahertz or something. We could could barely see any energy being absorbed at all. Yes. Um, The the Q was just way too low. And so the the, the problem with the large bandwidth is that, that there's less energy to actually be captured by the the receiving coil yeah lots of energy going into heating up the coil not very much energy actually turning the tag on so (laughs) (laughs) didn't get very far with that one um so we did so we did our first iteration and it was great because we learned a lot about about going through the process of making we still made a a matching circuit just was very just just didn't work but we still learned how to measure inductance uh with an oscilloscope that was uh basically just putting a resistor in series within the inductance and picking a frequency, picking several frequencies, and doing a phasor division of the voltage and the current to work out what the impedance was of the whole circuit and pulling the inductance out of that impedance calculation. So what's the actual design process for this matching circuit? We need some component values. How do we get component values? Well, what you do is once you've actually measured your your inductance of, of your coil, then you go to the data sheet and just look at all the formulas just, and just, start plugging values in that we know about, put them into the into the formulas, calculate capacitor values and inductor values, keeping in mind that you want to be within certain parameters. You know, you, you want your inductor to be more of an inductor than anything else. <laughs> more inductive than resistive more, is a good start, I that's think. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> more inductive than capacitive, got to stay well below its resonant frequency. Yeah, all of, the, yeah, all of those things. <laughs> Yeah, really just turn the handles, take a measurement, turn the handles on the maths, get some component values, see if they work. Pock them on the board. So first revision, had a crack at it, didn't really work. What did you change? Why do you think it helped? Okay, the first thing that happened is, okay, we've got to get this resistance down. Let's make the coil shorter. So we took out 50% of the coil by just putting the coil on one side of the board. The the other thing that we did is double the the trace width, or maybe more than doubled. Just make it bigger. Just get rid of those copper losses. Yeah. Yeah. So we did those two things, and then we then had to then redo all of the calculations again. <laughs> Thanks, spreadsheets. <laughs> and that in- oh, the first thing we had to do was to measure the inductor, the new inductor that we just created, using the process that was just described, you know, oscilloscope, resistor, phase changes, all of that sort lots of stuff. Of maths, yeah. Lots of maths. And then we had to do more maths to get these capacitor values, plonk them on the board, and... Um, well, then it worked. What happened? It just worked. Yeah. We got lucky. It worked. Get those values right, and then suddenly it just brings to life. Yeah. Got to love reading the manual. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the current working design revision here, Peter. One final question, though. Why is the coil on the back? I'm not seeing any traces on the top side of this PCB. Well, we've designed this so that people might uh, mount this on their projects so that it's just flush with the um, outside of the enclosure like this. So this is a simulation of the enclosure. We've got um, enclosure, big dev device. Our coil is as close to that as possible, so you get minimum interference. Yeah, nice. No, just lets you really just literally glue it to the inside of the box. Yeah. And hopefully the other side is close enough to the coil that it will still read. Yes. That's really That's cool. Right. Well, thanks for that discussion about the RFID project, Peter. Um, You'll be seeing this eventually. Well, we've still got some design work to go. So in the next couple of months, maybe you'll uh, be able to grab one of these and play with it yourself. Yeah, that's right. Thanks a lot. Cheers.